In today's video, I wanna take and hopefully demystify the process of making mead and fermentation. So let's get started. So I wanna tackle this topic from a top-down view. This video is hopefully for people who are unfamiliar with fermentation for mead specifically and the process of what's happening. So we're gonna look down from the top and see the basic things and then we'll kind of look in the weeds and see the specifics. But fermentation itself is really not that hard or difficult of a process when you really look at it from stages. So we have basically six, I'm gonna call six stages of fermentation. And this is applicable for literally every mead that you make. They all go through some form of these stages. So the six stages are, number one, preparation, which we'll talk about here in a second. Number two, mixing everything up, the, the act of just creating the initial mead, adding your yeast, and then of course letting it ferment. I'm kind of lumping those all into one. So that's the second stage. Third stage is happens multiple times in the process, but racking or moving said mead out of the container once it's done fermenting. The fourth stage is post-fermentation steps or adding anything to the mead that could re-ferment or not re-ferment. So just what do you do after your mead has moved out of the fermentation stage? And then number five is aging, what that looks like for us. And the last one is bottling or packaging your brew. I'm also gonna use an example of like my recipe card or my buddy doing the most recipe card to show you kind of what happens because we often see these cards and don't always explain every step. And I'll hopefully be able to tell you where each step is in the card. So let's start with number one, which is preparation. This is the act of finding your recipe card, making your recipe, gathering your ingredients, your honey, your water, your yeast, your fruit, your spices, whatever you're doing there. And then of course, very importantly, sanitizing all of your equipment. So you get all your ingredients, you get your sanitizers, you get your equipment, your vessels, your, your buckets, whatever you're gonna use to ferment in. I know that seems silly to talk about, but if you don't have all the right things to start, it's really hard to fix things later on if you don't start with a good process. So we've step one, gathered our ingredients. Number two, we are gonna take said ingredients and start mixing them together. So we're gonna use an example brew of a blueberry mead in this circumstance. We've gathered our honey, our water, our yeast, our blueberries, and we're ready to start this process. We mix all of those things together into, let's say a bucket, because we're gonna use that as our vessel. Now we're using this blueberry mead there are many different times you can add your blueberries or your fruits. So we'll talk about that here in a second, but we've mixed up our ingredients into our bucket. We've sanitized all our stuff before that, of course. And we're gonna let this thing start to ferment. What you'll see, the act of fermentation, is yeast consuming sugar that's found in, in this uh, process or in these different recipes. They're gonna consume fermentable sugar and convert that into two things, CO2, which comes in the form of bubbling. You'll see the bubbling leaving the airlock, leaving the mead as it's fermenting, and alcohol. Now we can't see the alcohol being present. So this is where the initial step of mixing everything up has one little bonus thing. In order to know how much alcohol you're gonna have in your brew, you have to have a thing called a hydrometer. It's a, a specific gravity measuring device. You float the hydrometer in some liquid and it will read a number on the side. You're gonna save that number or write it down so that we can use it later to figure out our total alcohol in the brew. So in step two, for this fruited mead, we went ahead and put our fruit in with it to get it started. Most of the time when you make a traditional mead or many other meads, you're gonna put all your ingredients in the front in the beginning, which is what we just did during step two. So step two, mix your stuff up, let it start to ferment. Within this, we've taken our hydrometer reading, we're also going to use this opportunity to start to give the yeast specifically nutrition. Yeast are just like us, they need food, and their food comes in many different forms. Stuff like Fermade O, which is an organic yeast nutrient, Fermade K, which is partially organic with some other components. Dimonium phosphate, there are many other things on the market 
I personally really like Fermade O, and you can buy it in a big container. I'll put a link down below if you'd like to do that. But we're gonna give our yeast nutrient. You can do this in many different ways, including just putting it all, when you mix everything up, you can add your yeast nutrient at a 24 hour mark, or if you wanna go really deep, you can do a staggered nutrient schedule, which is where you take all of your yeast nutrient and you split it into four parts, you add it on day zero, or add one part on day zero, two, four, and six. Either way, you need to feed your yeast in this stage two. Also put like a rough timeline of how long each stage might take. Every brew is different though. So this is not a total great um, sign of how long fermentation should be. We've gotten through our first two stages. We're now in stage number three, which is the post-fermentation moment where your yeast are done fermenting. You will notice they're done because generally speaking, the um, yeast will fall to the bottom or flocculate to the bottom a lot of the things that might have been floating around in the brew will also settle at the bottom and it might clear up a little bit. In order to know if your brew is actually done or if it's what we call degassing, which is the process of just expelling CO2 even post uh, the fermentation, you need to take another gravity reading. So within this, in our racking or moving our brew into a new container, we're gonna take a hydrometer reading. Pour more of your liquid into a vessel again, float the hydrometer again, and you have two different numbers now. You have a starting gravity and you have a current gravity or post-fermentation gravity. Let's say we started at 1.080 and we're now at 1.000. We can use an equation, as you see on screen, or a calculator to figure out our total ABV of our brew. So once you've done that, it's time for us to move it into a new container. I suggest to do this with a auto siphon in tubing in order to introduce less oxygen, which is very helpful to keep your brew nice. I would not suggest just pouring your brew into another vessel because that again will introduce oxygen. So we've got our stuff, we've mixed everything up, it's fermented, we've moved it into a new container with our gravity readings done so we know how alcoholic it is. We're now gonna look at the next steps to say, what do we wanna do with this brew? We've made our blueberry mead. We only have liquid that is this blueberry mead. No more blueberries in there at all. We're gonna go ahead and decide, do we want to make this sweeter? Do we want to add a spice? Do we wanna add some other sort of flavor component? Do we just wanna let it be as it stands? What do we wanna do with this thing? So if you want to make a brew sweeter, this is very important, you are going to take and you first need to either stabilize or pasteurize said brew. Both of these are two different things. Pasteurizing is the process of taking and halting any further fermentation by killing off the yeast via heating said brew. You can heat the brew up in a couple different methods using a sous vide, using um, a like pot and water. Regardless of how you do it, you're gonna heat up the liquid and I'll actually push you to a video my buddy doing the most is done talking about pasteurizing some. Here are the temps and times that you wanna use for your pasteurizing. Please be careful when you do this. If you do this in a big container, like a glass carboy, sometimes those carboys have little air bubbles or stuff like that. And when the air bubbles in those glass expand via heating, sometimes they can crack or shatter. So. I don't suggest to do this in a bigger vessel. I suggest to do this in bottles. So what you would do in that circumstance is move all of your mead into a bottle and then you would pasteurize it. The other method of doing this, which is a little simpler in my opinion, less risky, is using potassium sorbate and potassium metabisulfite. These two things in conjunction will halt further fermentation once the brew is done with the fermentation initially. So essentially what happens is you would take Go back to step number three, rack your mead into a new container, add your potassium metabisulfite and potassium sorbate, and then let it set for about 24 hours. And that neutralizes the yeast or any yeast that could be in there, allowing you to now be able to back sweeten. So if you wanted to back sweeten your brew in your pasteurizing, you're gonna want to actually back sweeten and then pasteurize because honey has wild yeast in it if you were to pasteurize and then back sweeten, there's a chance the wild yeast in the honey could take hold of the brew and actually start to referment. It's highly unlikely, but it could happen. So you want to back sweeten and then pasteurize. With the sorbate metabisulfite, you can just put those in and then back sweeten safely. 
So you can back sweeten your brew if you wanna do that. If you wanna add some spices, this is a great time to add your, your various spices you have, your nutmegs, your cloves, your other things. This is also a great time to add your other fruits and things. If you want to retain the sugars from said fruit, you will want to either pasteurize and or stabilize the brew. Let's say you're adding more blueberries and you wanna really keep the blueberry flavor going, you wanna do that, pasteurize or stabilize. Or if you want it to continue to ferment at this point, don't pasteurize or stabilize, add more sugar into the brew and it will continue to ferment because the yeast are still active. The spices probably won't activate fermentation. Essentially, this post-fermentation step is your way to really dress up the mead how you want it to. You're gonna actually take and add your extra flavors, your back sweetening stuff. You're gonna do stuff to make it more interesting or what you want. So we've done that. We've gone through four big steps now. Just to review, we got all of our stuff. We mixed it all together, pitched our yeast in. We let it ferment. We moved it into a new container after it had finished fermenting. We have now taken our blueberry mead and let's say we've uh, stabilized it or pasteurized it so we could back sweeten it. We added more honey. We're at the point now where we're gonna let this thing age. And in the aging process, you generally want to age in a glass or stainless steel vessel Plastic often has the ability to actually get oxygen through it. So you don't want oxygen to get to the brew. It also can, depending on your kind of plastic, add some off flavors. So age in glass or stainless steel and with as little headspace as possible, meaning the oxygen on top should be minimal. Again, oxygen and alcohol are not friends, especially at a lower ABV. So just be very careful with that. We're gonna let this thing set for however long you want. If you have a brew that's really strong, let's say your, your fermentation kicked everything up to like 14, 16% alcohol by volume. This thing is gonna need some time to age. So just let it set, hopefully with a small amount of headspace or oxygen on top and in a glass or stainless steel vessel. In this time, you can also decide if you want to let it naturally clear, meaning just let things fall out of suspension over time, which does happen, it just takes quite some time, or use a clearing method. There's a bunch of different ways you can clear your brews. There's a video I did on it, I'll push you to as well, link in the description of the eight different ways you can clear a brew. Regardless, this is a great time to clear it up or just let it set and age. And then once it's clear, once you feel like, okay, I'm ready to go ahead and cap or cork this thing or bottle it, package it up, whatever you wanna say, we're gonna go ahead and do that. We're gonna get our bottles and our corks and caps. We're gonna sanitize all of those things and using a auto siphon and tubing and a bottling wand, you're gonna nicely raise your liquid up and go ahead and bottle essentially into bottles, put your caps and corks on, maybe a label if you wanna do that to keep your stuff organized and you're done. So again, this is like a rough timeline. Uh, and this is just an example, let's say for my blueberry mead. It could all be different depending on what you're making. Some fermentations are fast and the process of, of post fermentation things is really quick. Sometimes it might take forever. There's a specific mead style called a Dvozhniak. This thing takes years. Sometimes people take 20 years to finish up their Dvozhniak. So, I'm not saying you're gonna go do that, but you are probably going to run into a situation where your fermentation might be different than what my little timeline says. So to review, get your stuff. Make sure you have all your equipment, all your sanitizers, all your recipes. Mix everything up, let it ferment. Take your gravity reading with a hydrometer whenever you first mix everything up and record it. Once it's done fermenting, move it into a new container, take another gravity reading, find out your alcohol by volume, Decide whether or not you want to make it sweeter, whether you want to add more ingredients, whether you want to stabilize it in general, what you want to do with it there in our step four. Number five, let it age for however long you want. It's up to you. And then step six is to bottle it. So here's an example of a recipe card I'll put up. It's actually for this blueberry mead. You'll notice that I put in here this, the beginning stages and steps of things with all of our ingredients. Then, because I like to stabilize my brews or pasteurize them to back sweeten, there's a little point where you stabilize or back sweeten. So the beginning is the primary, I'll put like little brackets. We've got preparation, which is above the thing. You've got your initial mixing everything up, which is right in this area right here. The racking is in between the stabilizing and like the Fermate O or the yeast nutrient. 
your stabilizing is that post fermentation and the back sweetening stuff you see. The aging comes after all of those things and then the bottling is after that. So there are things outside of the recipe card that aren't listed in there as far as steps. My buddy doing the most also does recipe cards and he does a great job of putting fermentation, primary fermentation versus secondary fermentation sort of information as you can see. I hope this has helped. I, this is probably a longer video than I intended it to be, but the fermentation process is sort of rinse and repeat. Once you have this down right here, you just sub out different ingredients or different, well, really just different ingredients because everything else is the same. You're always gonna hit these five processes, six processes in every mead. So I hope this has helped. Let me know if you have questions below. I hope you will uh, subscribe because I like to make mead content and educate you if you're interested in that. And of course, if you want to support the channel, there's things down below, but I, I mostly would like for you to ask some questions or just leave me feedback below. Did this help? Did this not help? Let me know. Thanks for watching. I'll see you in the future with another video. I've got actually another video I'm planning to do talking about more mead making processes. So I'll see you there. Cheers.